Green Left TV's Linda Seaborn spoke to Dr. Bob Boughton recently, an educator from the University of New England, when he was in Hobart for an education conference. Readers of Green Left Weekly will be familiar with Bob's work in bringing the Cuban literacy campaign to the outback town of Wilcannia, where a successful pilot was conducted. Here Bob talks about how the Cuban literacy campaign got started. They say it was actually Fidel who suggested to them that they should use it, they should try doing it with television. And so they developed it as a TV program to use in countries where there weren't a lot of resources. So it, it was it was basically a model that they developed to use in those countries of the global south. Um, so how successful has it been? Well, in um, in the countries where it's been deployed, in countries of the global south, they're getting something like a 90% completion rate for people who are joining the classes. Uh, I worked with the Cuban advisor group in Timor-Leste between 2006 and 2010 when they were rolling it out there. They've reached over 150,000 people with it, some of them in very remote communities. Bob explains how he became involved in East Timor and how he was exposed to the Cuban literacy campaign. I was a member of the Solidarity Movement during the Indonesian occupation. So, um, you know, in 1975, when the Indonesians invaded, the, the left groups in Australia, you know, played a lot, big role in supporting Fratel and the independence movement. And I was, I was a young activist then. We were talking about what we could do as a solidarity movement post-independence, and one of the things they said was, well, we've got to rebuild our adult education system. People don't know this, but Fretland actually ran a literacy campaign before the Indonesian invasion, and it was one of the main ways which they built the popular support for the independence movement was through a literacy campaign. And they were very keen to get one up and running again. And so we started working with them and with the Ministry of Education to work out how to get this happening. But until the Cubans came along, we were sort of floundering a bit because we didn't really have a model to do it on that kind of a scale. So I got a pretty good insight into how it worked by being in that evaluative role. Mm. And, you know, we used to go to villages and see how it was working and talk to the Cubans and we watched the whole way they developed it. Because of Bob's involvement in the literacy campaign in East Timor, he was invited to conduct a pilot program in Wilcannia in outback New South Wales. In that first phase when we were building the community support for it, we went to every organisation in town, the health service, the shire, the, um, the school, the youth centre, and, and got, them, got their support before we started. So how did it change the lives of the 16 community members who've graduated so far? Well, the, um, when we talk about a campaign, I think that one of the most important things is it's not just the students that it impacts, it impacts everybody. It's just energised people to take on some of the other issues yeah. that they're facing. Okay, so you've described literacy as a class issue. Can you um, elaborate on that? Everybody knows this in the sociology of education is that the people who come from working class or um, yeah, from working class communities and backgrounds, whether they be rural communities or urban communities, are regularly disadvantaged by the way the school system operates, such that by the time you get to year 10, 11, 12, a lot of the people from those less advantaged communities, their kids have left school. So the mm -hmm. there is a, a clear kind of relationship between the kind of society you've got, the level of inequality you've got in the society, and what you get out the other end of the education system. It's a class issue because if you don't address the inequality at the, amongst the adults, it's really hard to break the cycle of what's happening in the school system. And the Cubans got onto this in 1961, the Timorese got onto this in 1999. If you've got a mass of your adult population that has very low literacy, you're not going to be able to build your society as an equal kind of society. There is 
probably around 10 to 15 percent of the population has very minimal literacy. And if you look at people, say people in jail, it's much higher than that, you know. If you look at people who are in, you know, what we call disadvantaged groups, you find they've got much higher levels of low literacy. Mm. And people who have got good literacy don't even know what they've got. You know, it's like whiteness. You don't see your own literacy. Mm. So until you actually have to work closely with people who don't have that level of literacy, you don't realise how many barriers there are in the way of doing some of the most, you know, even quite ordinary things that you're trying to do can be a real problem if you don't feel confident about your literacy level. Yeah. And logic? Yeah, well, we say that the core of it really is critical thinking, you know. It's not, it's not just what you can read, it's what you can understand. Mm. And sometimes that means being able to read between the lines, not just read the lines. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what do you think is the role for people who are social activists in, in improving education in Australia? The, historically, the people who have driven literacy campaigns have been people who wanted a better society. That's where it's come from. Um, and some of the most important literacy campaigns historically have been in countries where there's been a strong socialist movement. So, and, and some of the most famous, well, Cuba, obviously, mm. but there's others, like Kerala in India, where they regularly elect a left socialist government. They've got 99% literacy, whereas in other states in India where they haven't had that experience, they've got a much lower level of literacy. So what for me is important is that activists in social movements, in the environment movement, the women's movement, whatever, see that one of the barriers to their capacity to organise is the low literacy level of the people who have most to gain by changing society. So is there a role for the social movements in this process? You know, like, is, is this something that is just the government's responsibility or the community service agency's responsibility or do we as activists and social movement people, do we have a responsibility to get involved in this, you know?